I'm not sure they know how you they vote know because that. that's that's that... not on record anyway, no, is it? It is not. Um, and Ken says these are only able to be carried out because of computers, internet, mobile phones, etc. It seems to me that these inventions are ruining our lives, and therefore we were much safer and much happier without these inventions. There is a school of thought that would agree with that, Ken, very oh, much I so. I sort of often think it myself, really. Me I mean, too. I, mean, I... The, the, the dark web. I mean, yeah. how many people have been murdered because of the dark web? You do wonder as Brianna, well. Brianna Jai. Yeah, you do wonder. I look at my kids' generation and I wonder whether they will grow up and have a complete rejection of all of this and they will just say, enough, because they will think we were all insane for having become so addicted to our phones. Mm. I wonder whether, as a generation after generation do, they will reject it. Wayne, blame Western governments for the rise of China. People were saying this ten years ago and every country ignored it. That is a really good point, mm. Wayne, because we've taken Chinese investment and obviously our houses are full of items we well, bought from made and, in and China. And if you remember as well, we had to get them out of the 5G, while we? We did. Take, get them out, get, literally extricate them yeah, from Yeah, that us. was at least one thing I think they did quite well. Yeah. And Jan says, if they've seen the electoral roll, what else have they been looking at? That's the threat to our democracy. They never do things by halves. I'm much more worried about my own government looking at what I do online, to be fair. The point is, though, go back, we said before, the electoral roll is a do public document which you can access if you go to your library. Mm. Very good morning to you. I'm Ben Leo alongside Steph Tetchy, and this is Saturday Morning Live. It's so great to have your company this morning. We have an action packed show for you. We do indeed. All of the day's top stories with Olympian and broadcaster Chris Akabusi and apprentice winner and entrepreneur Marnie Swindles. The Labour Party have shared new analysis today showing that a thousand shoplifting offences take place every day, equating to almost one theft per minute. We'll be discussing these stats with a former police officer and the director of a charity for those facing poverty. And there's some bad blood, wink wink, amongst concert goers as more than £1 million could already have been lost in the UK to fraudsters pretending to offer Taylor Swift tickets. Are the scammers going to scam, scam, scam? And don't forget, we want to hear from you. We would love to hear what you think. Send your views and post your comments by visiting gbnews.com slash your say. That scam, 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 by the way. Ooh, is, that, is that a, a I hint love that. to the Taylor Swift Yes, song? it is. Players right. are going to play, play, play. Are you a Taylor fan, Ben? No, look, I, I, I don't hate her. It's just completely not my bag, just okay. like Beyonce. I'm more, um, I'm more sort of like punk rock, bit of Blink-182. Don't like worry. That. By the end of the show, I will convert you okay. into a Swifty. All right, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll also be speaking, by the way, to a man who, by this time, tomorrow will be running his 120th marathon. Uh, he reckons, well, I'm not going to tell you what his secret is, but it's very, very strange. But before we do anything else, Cameron Walker, surprise, surprise, has all your news headlines. <laughs> Good morning. It's one minute past ten. I'm Cameron Walker in the GB newsroom. The Metropolitan Police has had to apologise for an earlier apology over a comment made to an anti-Semitism campaigner at a pro-Palestine march. Gideon Falter was prevented from crossing a road near a demonstration in London after an officer described him as openly Jewish. An initial apology from the force caused, caused offence for suggesting opponents of marches must know that their presence is provocative. The Home Office has written to the Police Commissioner and Mayor of London after describing the incident as concerning and unacceptable. Shadow Policing Minister Alex Norris told GB News that there's no place for hate. The Met Police have now accepted it's wrong, so that's, you know, that is a good thing. You know, it isn't for politicians to do operational policing, as you know. You know, police must feel that they can uh, uh, keep safe and to organise these types of uh, public events in a way that is safe. However, it must, you know, there can be no place for hate in this. And if there is racism, in this case, anti-Semitism, there cannot be that sort of thing. Three people who died in a car crash near a retail park in northwest London have been named by police. Mohamed Zaydani, Mohamed Ghazi, and Sahail Zufika, all in their early 20s, died when their vehicle crashed through a car park fence, hitting a footbridge. It happened last weekend, and the men were pronounced dead at the scene. It's understood two other passengers in the vehicle were injured, but their condition is not life threatening. Investigations into the cause of the crash are continuing. A man who sets himself on fire outside the New York court where former President Donald Trump's hush money trial is being held has died. 
Maxwell, as, as a rello, was taken to hospital in a critical condition, suffering extensive injuries. Witnesses say he pulled pamphlets with conspiracy theories out of a backpack and threw them in the air before dousing himself with flam flammable liquid. The Trump campaign has released a statement offering its condolences to those who saw the incident. Witness Fred Gates describes what happened. I was skeptical at first. I thought it, it was a gag, like he was going to... I didn't think he was going to actually light himself on fire. Um, but when it seemed to... It, it seemed like he had real purpose. Everybody started to run away from him. And then that's when he went up. Paramedics have checked over four men after a fire ripped through a historic pub that suffered significant damage. Thick black smoke was seen rising from the roof of the Burn Bullock in Mitcham in southwest London. Half of the ground, first and second floors of the building were damaged, while the roof of the now derelict pub was also destroyed. 80 firefighters battled the blaze at the Heritage listed building. The cause of the fire is under investigation. A whistleblower claims the Conservative Party was warned that MP Mark Menzies' alleged misuse of campaign funds may have constituted fraud, but there was no duty to report it. The filed MP lost the Conservative whip and was suspended as one of the Prime Minister's trade envoys after The Times published claims he used political donations to cover medical expenses and pay off bad people who had locked him in a flat. Mr Menzies disputes the allegations. The party says it has been looking into the claims for several months and Lancashire Police are reviewing the available information. A major parade honouring the English men and women who have died serving the nation is taking place to mark 130 years of the Royal Society of St George. Hundreds of military and naval cadets will march past the Cenotaph in central London today alongside members of the society. Chairman Nick Dutt says it's important young people are proud of their country. We're trying to get the younger people involved um, in what we do. Patriotism has taken a hit over the last few years. Um, and it tends to be a lot of older people who are involved. So the importance of getting younger people involved and taking part in this is critical to us, I believe. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to the gbnews.com website slash alerts. Now it's back to Ben and Steph. Welcome back. Today in Glasgow, two groups will march through the streets calling for Scottish independence. Yes, Believe in Scotland and Pensioners for Independence will march through the city before arriving at George Square, where a rally will take place. Some of the speakers will include First Minister Hamza Youssef, musician and campaigner Pat Kane and Ross Greer, MSP, are all expected to make speeches. Joining us now is GB News Scotland reporter Tony Maguire. Morning, Tony. Uh, I thought this issue was settled in 2014 with the first Indy Ref. Why don't the Scots, or at least the pro-independence Scots, just let it go? Good morning. Well, indeed, this is very much um, high on the agenda for three of Scotland's parties, um, being the SNP, the Greens and ALBA, of course. Um, but indeed, this um, issue, arguably, in their eyes at least, is not over until it is over. Now, as you mentioned today, we're going to see a march from around half twelve today here in Kelvin Way in the west end of Glasgow into George Square in the centre of the city, where that rally will be held featuring of course, First Minister Hamza Yusuf. Now, this has arguably been a really bad week for Hamza Yusuf, first with them um, rowing back on that really critical green energy policy to you know, cut greenhouse gases by 75%. Then we obviously had Peter Murrow's arrest on Thursday, bringing the, you know, the party back into the shadows of that time last year. But today, they will be hoping that he can finish this week on a high. However, um, in the midst of everything else, you know, the pro-independence campaign has its own issues and they'll be hoping for some cohesion and unity today um, as those groups march through. Now, there is, believe it or not, quite even a split within the pro-independence movement because, you know, 
Scottish Green MSPs, well, they won't march alongside Alba MSPs. Um, and indeed, that division is what's led to another march happening here in the same city in only a couple of weeks' time. That, of course, with the Scottish Greens, you know, threatening to, to leave the coalition government with the SNP, leaving them a minority government, that is also going to be high on Hamza Yusuf's mind this week. But for today, at least, there's going to be a, a, a pause to the pro-Palestinian protests here in Glasgow and the pro-independence movement, well, they'll be hoping for big numbers and a big attendance today to show that there is still an appetite for many people here in Scotland. Mm, interesting. All right, Tony, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, well, uh, 2014, they said, was the once-in-a-lifetime vote and uh, yeah. it would be the once-in-a-generation vote and that was it. But there we go. That's the. Well, uh, hopefully they're thinking that maybe they'll be lucky second time round, but we'll have to see if it ever yeah, takes place. We well, SMP, yeah. Now to look through the top stories of the today, we're delighted to be joined by Olympian and broadcaster Chris Abkabusi and apprentice winner and entrepreneur Marnie Swindles. Morning, Good morning, guys. Morning, morning. morning. Thank you for Congratulations, <laughs> Stephanie. Thank you. Look at you. Well, I've got a super fan of you guys, so I'm feeling very relaxed. <laughs> so thank you for coming in. But should we start about the Canary Island protest that's happening today? If you tell us a bit more, Chris. Yes. So, so, so basically, um, Grand Canaria, I think it's 11, 13 islands, whatever, um, very popular de destination. Uh, there are 2.2 million inhabitants. There are 13.9 million visitors mm. and there's a stretch on the resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and the protesters are basically saying, um, great, GDP, great, 35% GDP. However, we're sleeping in our cars on the beaches, not out of choice, but out of necessity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can understand yeah. their complaint. <laughs> you know, we've been... had a lot of uh, press talking about migrants crossing our water. Yeah. Oh, um, Chris, that's completely different. Well, no, no, hold on, no, 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 hold on, no, no, hold on. It's a broad guy on holiday. Well, no, no, but, uh, but, well, no, 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 no. Well, that'd be a lovely idea, but a lot of the Brits aboard have got second and third homes in, in, in the Canary Islands. That's still different. Well, no, well, no, 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 but it's not different because, because what you're doing, you're displacing the inhabitants. Our complaint is not necessarily about the migrants, but stress on the NHS, yep. stress on schools, Ex stress on infrastructure. And what they're saying is our infrastructure <laughs> is, is, is not just creaking, it's this... Um, Dissembling right. in front of other I think I yeah. think that is the issue, though. I think the infrastructure is the issue. I don't think yep. I think the anger has been slightly misdirected here because I don't think tourism is the issue. Mm -hmm. yep. We know that tourism has huge potential to boost economies, growth. It can it could really enhance mm -hmm. the people of the Canaries' livelihoods if it filters down. Mm -hmm. So I think, and a lot of the papers are reporting this, that it's the model, it's yep. the fact that the business classes are being supported by the political classes and the money staying at the top. If we can just figure out how that comes down, mm -hmm. I. I I think they would be great so for the tourism. Do you think Brits need to be more aware, though, when they are visiting, visiting the islands, that maybe, you know, this is an island which is overstretched and it's got limited resources, so maybe we need to respect it a bit more when I, we are travelling there as British people? I don't know if the onus is on the Brits to resolve that issue. I think they're going there, they're taking their money there, they're going to spend, they're going to enjoy, and really that should be considered somewhat of a benefit to, to the host country because they're pouring in all their money mm -hmm. and their hard earned money, but it's just the infrastructure on that side. I don't think it's reaching the, the right The Canary people. Islands, right, they yeah. solely rely on tourism abroad. Mostly Brits, Tenerife, Gran Canaria, Lanzarote. Mm -hmm. The problem is the local government, the protesters say, there's a massive protest today. I think 70,000 people are going to congregate in Santa Cruz and Tenerife. Mm -hmm. There's been cars and placards saying, tourists go home, you're yeah. not welcome. The problem is, right, it's not the Brits going there spending money, it's the local government who the protest protesters are accusing of hoarding the money and not dishing out the, the wealth to improve Precisely. their own lives. I, yeah. I think that's it. I think it's misdirected. I think, the, I think the Canaries and the local people need tourism. I think tourists want to go there. I think the gap is that middleman. We see it all the time in places yeah. like the Caribbean as well, where it's that big hotel chains that benefit, not the people on the ground. I think that's the issue. Chris, I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've got to say, <laughs> there is no difference between tourists going to the Canaries and spending billions of pounds 
to migrants crossing the channel. Like, no, well, no, 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 Ben, I'm not having that. No, no, I'm not having that, no, no, Ben. It is about the infrastructure and it's about the resources. I'm not talking about the, the poor migrants who haven't got any money and uh, those of us who are buying up all the infrastructure mm. so that someone who's born in Fort Ventura or Tenerife can't actually live in a house, has got to sleep on this, in, in his uh, car because... You want your second or third home. So, so, so it's about the infrastructure and the resources. That was my point, Ben. Yeah, my, 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 my point is that generally migrants coming across the channel aren't initially contributing to the economy. They're, yeah, being, they're being housed in hotels for £12 billion pounds a day. Yeah, um, no, know, I've not got an argument with that. Whereas... I've, not, I've not got an argument with that. I'm talking about the resources. Got it. All yeah. right, should we move on? There's another yeah. um, story. I don't know if you've seen this video doing the rounds on the internet over the past couple of days. It was front page in all the papers as well. So at the pro-Palestine march, I think it was last week, um, uh, Anna, we've got the video. Let's show you the video. It's a, it's a Jewish protester who goes to the pro-Palestine march and a Met police officer says, pretty much, you're Jewish, you shouldn't be here. Here's the clip. I can't believe this was... You are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. So, Marnie, did oh, you have a right to yeah. be there? Absolutely. I think the police are in the wrong with this one. I think it, he's not causing a stir. He's not trying to uh, disrupt the actual process in any way. He's being censored just by being, just by being there. And I think he has every right to be but there. But don't you think the police were worried about his safety? Mm -hmm. You're at a pro-Palestinian march. You. You're a Jewish man. You're not trying to hide your identity. He shouldn't have to. Mm -hmm. But there's a time and place, and I a think... A time and place for being? He was just being. He was just... Well, no, we don't know, do we? We don't know. The police said he was antagonising. There, there must be a reason why they said he was antagonising. Uh, everything, is, everything is contextual. If he is there making slurs, antagonising people, then granted, maybe move along. But from my understanding, his presence should not be censored. He should mm. not have to move along by just being. And what kind of territory are we going to enter into mm -hmm. if we start moving people away just because they make other groups uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. There should be space for everyone. His right to be on that street is as, is as valid as the pro-Palestinian march. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, so context is everything. Mm -hmm. And we don't know. We've seen a little clip. I would actually feel for the police. Um, we've all got cameras and phones and every single thing they do is now being videoed. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself the question, was that policeman being anti-Semitic or was he concerned for the citizen and his safety in, in, in any sort of way? Now, of course, the citizen has a right to be on that street, but there's this vibrant protest going on that has been actually a lot of the language now because of people like the former Home Secretary demonising the march, a legitimate march, and we don't know what this guy... I, I don't want to put any words in his mouth. I don't know what this guy was doing. Uh, appar apparently, Chris, he was leaving a synagogue and needed to cross the road. I OK, well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. I, I, see, I, uh, my understanding was that he was actually being antagonistic. But, yeah, yeah. clear. If he's just a, a bloke, a British man, wanting to cross the street, when well, you've got a skull cup on, shouldn't prevent you from crossing mm -hmm. the street. In, in fact, the police should have assisted him to cross yeah. the street, if that's what he's yeah. trying to do. I think that that could start a very dangerous precedent if we yeah. start moving people away just because they're... Just by their, their own being is creating distance. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think My main thing was it. it's a safety thing because yeah. it's more like... I don't think he should conceal his identity, but the fact that if you're surrounded by so many pro-Palestinian um, protesters, you don't know how they're going to react to Well, yeah, exactly. So, so if it kicked off... Problem, but should we, should we be doing that? Should we be encouraging this idea that someone, one person versus mm. 100 people, yeah. that person has to move out of the way because we can't trust the, the march? Yeah. Surely the, the owner should I'm, be I'm on the you. march behaving correctly and You're right. in a rightful way, not one person having to move Mano, to what make happens, allowence. What, OK, if, God forbid, something had kicked off and the British citizen was put in physical danger and someone had seen a police why didn't you try and stop it? I mean, I'm just trying to say, you're damned if you do, if you're damned if you don't, the policeman is doing a very tough 
job yeah. right in the public eye. Oh, I'm with, I'm with you on that. I think the police get a lot of stick. I yeah. think they get a really hard time. And as you said, they're constantly under scrutiny for what they do. But I do think on this occasion, I think we're entering a real dangerous I mean, it's, it's territory. It's not the first incident with the police. There was a video a couple of weeks back of a woman complaining that someone had a swastika placard and the copper said, what do you want me to do about it? And so on and so on. Mm. Anyway, should we move on to another story? Yeah. Um, Richie Sunak yesterday uh, launched his... Uh, well, announced, rather, his benefit reform. So he's basically saying that those with depression and anxiety, this is one strand of the reforms, they won't be allowed uh, sickness payments from work. Uh, apparently, the, the benefits bill for sickness payments is something like £50 billion a year at the moment, and he reckons that if it carries on the way it is, there's going to be another £20 billion mm -hmm. by the end of the decade. So are we, Marnie, a nation of wets? Do we need to, dare I say it, I'll Ooh. get cancelled for this, man up? Um, I mean... <laughs> Person up, yeah, OK. <laughs> I, am, I am to some extent with Richie Sunak on this. I'm not completely heartless. Yeah. People sometimes need time. People go through things and they need that moment to breathe. But I do think there is an abuse of sick notes and, and people abusing the system. And I think the more stringent we make it, the more people that really do need that support can get that support. Mm -hmm. I also think there's a lot to be said about a good day's work. And I think it goes beyond just the financial benefits, but... What it does for your productivity, who you meet, your, your sense of self-esteem. I think getting the nation into work, especially, I, I, I understand that there's one million job vacancies. I think the more people working, the better for their own, their own health. I think it's a good way forward. But surely there's no time limit if you've got mental health problems. You cannot put a time limit and say, within a year, I'll be feeling great and the I'll be back to work. What do we say to those people who are going through, you know, long-term illnesses, who are facing anxiety, depression, I, and yeah. it's an endless cycle for them. I understand it. I, and honestly, I empathise with them. But I, the reality is, is that the world keeps turning. And mm. at some point, you have to just sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and move forward. I think a year is a long time to allow someone the grace to come to terms with whatever they've got going on and try and find a route out. But I think that's what Richie Sunak is getting at, is there needs to be that intention to do better. There needs to be that intention to, to get back on your feet. And I think with that, people's lives will change for the better anyway. Chris, I got a lot of flack yesterday because I said, uh, when it comes to anxiety and depression, I suggested that if people did more exercise and maybe focus a bit more on their diet and nutrition, that would go a little way towards making them feel a bit better. As an Olympian, are you on board with that or am I just mm. being a bit too simplistic? You know, look, uh, <laughs> you can't have a general rule like that. Yeah. You think, again, context specific, I don't know the person's going through. I do think that Generation Z have got a tough stick in so much as we told them about being aware of your mental health and all that sort of stuff. And then when they're aware of their mental health, you say, no, but you can't be mentally ill, get back to work. I in my day, you, you said man up. You can't say man up anymore. <clears throat> we got on with it. Yeah. yeah we, we, we just got on with it. And, be, and and because of that, some people top themselves. Mm. Yeah. So, you, you know, you have got to be careful of that one. Um, but, of course, you're right. Get up, make your bed, put your clothes on, step into the world and answer the question. The world says, what have you got today? Yeah. Jump in and deliver. So I get that too. That's the thing. I don't think it's about eradicating mental health. I think depression, anxiety, these are real things that people mm -hmm. struggle with. But it's about managing that. It's about how long are you going to be... Yeah be at mercy to that feeling before you say, you know what, I'm taking control of my own life, I'm seizing this and I'm exactly. going to get back to I just work. think, what can we do for ourselves first to prevent it getting, yeah. you know, uh, escalating, I guess, before we have to go to see a mm. GP or mental health experts. But anyway, Chris, Marnie, thank you so thank much. You. Great thank start, you. very feisty. <laughs> <laughs> Still to come, we'll be finding out what's happening to Taylor Swift fans with their ticket scams. But up next, Labour says there is a theft a minute in England. What does this mean during a cost of living crisis? This is Saturday Morning Live on GB News Britain's news channel. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. One more story in. Uh, Milton Keynes, absolute chaos in the city. 300 odd youths arrested or at least involved in a, uh, a, a big, stampede. A stampede. A stampede. Yeah, what, what's been going on? A stampede through the. Uh, there we are. This is the video. So this is a stampede through a uh, shopping centre in Milton Keynes. I think, Amy, you live there, don't you? You live nearby. For those, live, on, for those on radio, we can see literally hundreds, scores of kids. I think kids. they're about 300 kids. Are they in school uniforms? So, yeah, quite oh, a few. Yeah. Um, this is as they've security, broken up from school, presumably. Security tried to intervene. They've been accused of being heavy-handed. But I think this speaks to the fact that the landscape of youth services has just been decimated and there's literally nothing for Sorry, kids. Hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. You think that this has happened because social services have been diluted? Youth services. This is because there's no police around, there's no oversight, there's no deterrent, and 300 kids think that they can run through a shopping centre, Why frightening are shoppers out of their kids lives. Going to a shopping centre. Amy, sorry, my kids, lit- my kids would not be behaving like that because there's no ping pong available at the local Aren't yeah. your kids like age centre? four and five? These are teenagers, and our teenagers are headed into a world where there are no leisure services. Oh, there are no Nothing to do with crime. If we up the ante on basketball, what? it's not going to stop kids being stabbed on the street. What creates antisocial behaviour is having nothing to no, do. It's lack of discipline in the home, lack of discipline in the home, and lack of policing on the what streets, and do? and a judiciary and a penal system that is utterly liberal. You're going right to the end of the line. What about the preventative but measures? What about the people that these people affect by running through a shopping centre and stampeding? When there's right. mothers with kids in prams, frightened out of their lives. And and we're worried about the social services but I'm aspect. I'm talking about that's carrot. Perhaps You're to talking it. about stick, yeah, right? Yeah. So how long does your solution take to resolve it? Mine takes about thirty seconds. More oh. police, bang them up. Yours. Russell, should parents be fined? More police, bang them up. Uh, absolutely. And the kids should be taken to task. Welcome back. You're with Ben and Steph on Saturday Morning Live, only on GB News. Don't forget to keep sending your emails and questions, gbnews.com forward slash your say. But first of all... New analysis released by the Labour Party today shows that 1,000 shoplifting offences take place each day across England and Wales. Wow. OK, well, that equates to something like almost a theft every minute of the day. So different freedom of information requests from police forces have also shown that charges have fallen by a quarter over the past five years, so they're getting away with it, basically. Yeah, it's a kind of double-edged sword, because with these kind of statistics, what does it say about the cost of living crisis? And also, it says, what is the government doing about such shoplifting cases? Mm. Well, with these kind of stats during the round, what does it say about the government's handling of the crime, as you said, Stephen? Yeah. What do these stats tell us about how society is handling the cost of living crisis? Joining us now to talk about these stats is former DCI at the Met Police, Peter Kirkham. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. So, look, we've seen, we've seen in recent months uh, something akin to America, where if you go into supermarkets or pharmacies, they've got even the most s- simple of products, such as steaks or alcohol, locked up in uh, cases, security locked cases where you have to get a member of staff to come and unlock it for you. I went into, um, I think it was the co-op the other day, and they had steaks, rump steaks, with security tags on. What's this a sign of? Are we, you know, reminiscent of of America's downfall on that front? Um, To a certain extent, I guess we are. Uh, But it's mainly a sign of the fact that retail theft is through the roof and that retailers are doing all that they can to try and Uh, prevent those thefts taking place. Um, All these security measures um, are are one thing for the big players, uh, your Tesco's and your Sainsbury's and such like, but when it comes to small independent corner shops, they're not going to be in a position to invest in all this security technology, and so they're going to be at risk as well. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the stats showing this rise in shoplifting. Um, I very much suspect that the rise is steeper and the total number is much, much more uh, than the recorded crimes because a huge number of shoplifting offences, well, they're not even noticed, some of them, 
Um, but even a lot of those that are noticed by the shop staff uh, aren't reported to police for one reason or another. I just want to bring in Director of Punk Against Poverty, Stephanie Carenz. Thank you, Stephanie, for joining us on the show today. Don't you think hard times call for desperate measures, and that's why we're seeing the rise of cases when it comes to shoplifting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm seeing lots of talk in the news about the rise of criminal gangs, but nowhere near enough talk about the human aspect that people cannot afford to eat. And that mm -hmm. is what's causing a big, big rise. And there's lots of talk about, you know, how we need to be harsher with punishments. And I don't disagree when it is criminal gangs, but we also need to be looking at how can we support people better so that they're not having to resort to shoplifting. I mean, I'm seeing it in my own local shops, mums stealing things in front of my eyes, you know, when they've got kids in tow. Mm. There's a real sense of desperation out there and we need to be supporting people. Peter, isn't the problem that, um, I, I say it all the time because it's a great example, Rudy Giuliani in New York, the New York mayor in the mid-2000s, he had a broken window theory, which was you stamp out the low-level crime, the vandalism, and that stops it escalating to more serious crimes. Do we, do we not need a zero tolerance approach, regardless of how much people are struggling? The broken windows theory um, is um, much wider than just New York and uh, that period in time. Um, it's well researched and well documented in academic literature. Mm. Uh, and we know it works. We know that if you allow a neighborhood to start going downhill and you don't pay attention to the the begging offences and the drunkenness offences and the littering offences, then very rapidly there's a downward spiral um, where more serious crimes start coming along because nobody cares for this place, so you know, so why should we? Um, it's But, Peter, can, can I just it's interject? Not, it's not necessary to deal with it. It's not necessary to prosecute everybody as long as it is dealt with. And that might mean a caution, it might mean words of advice in some cases, as long as something is done. But Peter, for, for that to happen, you also need coppers to attend the scene of the incident. There Very was a story much. during the rounds yesterday that in some incidents, I think one police force, Suffolk, they were taking 18 hours to respond to low-level vandalism calls from sort of yobs in the street. So if there's no, if coppers aren't turning up to incidents, that we can't even get to that point. No, indeed. And the investigation of offences uh, after the fact, once they've happened, um, it, it's time consuming and difficult in many circumstances. And so th these things all come together to make it a very difficult problem to solve when you look at it and think, well, it's the simplest thing in the world. Mm. We can also trace it, trace it back to Theresa May, another of her magnificent successes whilst Home Secretary, um, reducing... Uh, low-value thefts to a whole new category of offence that can be dealt with by a, a streamlined process in the court system. And that's just to the whole thing being deprioritised. And, Stephanie, how do you think we can reverse this trend, especially amongst young people who, you know, they're just feeling quite depressed about the future, depressed about what's going on in society, they're all together, and crime to them seems like what is paying at the moment. So how do we reverse this trend? I mean, I personally think we need a kind of two-pronged approach. Harsher punishments for those who are criminal gangs going out shoplifting. Um, and certainly, shops need to be able to call the police and have the police turn up, regardless of the value of the item, if, if that's the case. But for those who are shoplifting because they're struggling, um, I mean, ultimately, we need to make the cost of living more affordable. But, you know, there needs to be support. We need to be looking at, you know, is there mental health issues involved? Is that what's sort of spared this on? Is it poverty? Are they struggling to eat? And we need to be looking at how we can support people with those sort of issues. I mean, there's, there's so many things that can come into play when it's a first time offender. It's not somebody who's doing it as a business. You know, it's not some criminal enterprise. And we really need to be looking at the root causes there and how we can support people better rather Steph, than just, just talking about punishments. Just last word to you, if you don't mind. What are some of the most common items people are stealing? You mentioned single mums, for example. Mm. What are they stealing? 
I mean, I was in a co-op a couple of weeks ago and there was a mum at the self-scan machines, which obviously have increased shoplifting. Um, she had three young children with her and a baby in a carrier. And it was a basic shop, you know, a small kind of one carrier bag basic shop. She scanned everything in and then she walked out without paying. You know, there weren't, from what I could see, any expensive items in there. You know, I don't know what the stats are for what the big supermarkets are losing, but I know it's increased on the low value items. And we've seen it in our own shop. We've got a small shop and we're losing about two items on average a day and it used to be the designer items we were losing and now it's a bit of everything you know it, yeah. it's basic props and things you know so there's been a real change in what we're losing sign of the times eh well thank you really both is. peter kirkham thank former you. dci at the met police and director of punk against poverty stephanie Curran. It's, uh, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's a hard if, I, one. if I saw a single mother stealing milk for her baby, there's yeah. no way on earth I'm going to go and grass her up. No, so I wouldn't either. I wouldn't. But, but that said, I do think we need to. Uh, that broken window theory is a real thing. You need to stamp out low level crime to stop more serious I just think crime, supermarkets are too trusting as well now because there's hardly any workers anymore. When you go in, it's just automated till. So it's actually more easy for people. Well, did you hear to about that Sainsbury's worker that got what? sacked for, for um, using a bag for life, a 30p bag? He worked well, for Sainsbury's for 30 years, yeah. he did a morning shop after a night shift, yeah. took a bag, forgot to pay for it, it's 30p. And, and he sacked got him. sacked. Yeah, so oh, come there we go. <laughs> come right, up. still to come, we're going to be joined by the 63-year-old marathon man to hear about his secret tips to maintaining peak performance. Can you guess the secret ingredient which he says is the trick to longevity? But next, they say the players are going to play, play, play. But are the scammers going to scam, scam, scam? The Swifties even more for concert tickets. This is Saturday Morning Live on GB News, Britain News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my I argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. J.K. Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners. The Harry Potter author has called for an investigation into why political parties are embracing the language of pro-trans groups. So is it time to ditch campaign groups such as those? Well, welcome again to my clashes, former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza, also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. I think the cash report is really welcome. I think there's been a huge amount of agreement, including from some uh, trans rights campaigners, that there's an awful lot of good in the cash report. I, I, I think that I'm more concerned about Mermaids, which is currently under a charity commission uh, investigation, uh, and some of the reports, if they're to be believed, like sending out chest binders, are more alarming. Mm. I think on Stonewall, which has been has done such great work uh, over the past 30 years uh, uh, on LGBT rights. You said what two year olds could be trans. Now, that, that is one of the most horrifying things I read today. Actually, JK Rowling tweeted that out there. To say that a two year old can think that they can be another gender when my four year old still thinks she's Elsa on some days. You yeah. know, there's no common sense. And, and it, to me, it's I very, think it was very badly phrased. It's, that, very, I agree. it's very sinister that these people actually believe that these kids want to change gender and and unfortunately out there there are parents that almost see a trans kid as a fashion accessory now and i think this whole um agenda has pushed on people that this is normal to change gender and we have to push back and as i said earlier to be trans is not normal. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't agree it's with that extreme. I think, no, I think it's, it's I think extreme. It's a big step, Adam, but there are clearly people throughout history uh, uh, who, who have uh, been But it's trans. not normal behaviour, is it? I think, for, I think as far as children are concerned, children need to be given the space uh, to, um, uh, to explore the world, and that can mm. include experimenting with, uh, you know, um, uh, breaking previous gender stereotypes. That doesn't mean that people should be sort of labelled at the age of two, which I completely uh, disagree mm. with. Welcome 
Welcome back, Ben and Steph, with you on Saturday Morning Live. Your emails are flying in, uh, especially yeah. about the thefts. Apparently, one shoplifting theft a minute. Roger, good morning to you. You say, I was born into a poor family, but nobody stole. In poverty, uh, we can still pay thousands on tattoos. Sorry, people are in poverty, but can still pay thousands on tattoos and delivered uh, meals to your door. Interesting. And we also have had one in from Jacqueline who says there's no excuse for single mum stealing. Can't afford to feed your kids, don't have them. Mm, yeah, but it doesn't always work out like that. No, circumstances change. It's quite hard. Uh, Donald says if coppers were free to be around rather than standing at the side of the road watching marches, maybe they could deal with more crime. And then also we have Sarah who says I'm a security guard for a well-known supermarket. These days when we catch shoplifters, it's weekly shop and not much stealing to sell on. The cost of living is real. Mm. It definitely is. And Great stuff. I think, you know, different people are experiencing different things and how they're handling the cost Very of living crisis. Very insightful comment, especially from a security guard. We'll keep those emails coming Thank in. You. GBnews.com forward slash your say. But now, are you a Swifty? I am a big Swifty. Like, I spent most of yesterday listening to her new double album and I just love Taylor Swift. She's just... Psh, she is amazing. Well, but... I, I, I don't get it, so you can pick up this Oh, oh don't this worry. Is, this is I all will. on you, this I one. will. It seems there is some bad blood amongst concert goers, as more than a million pounds could already have been lost in the UK to fraudsters pretending to offer Taylor Swift concert tickets. Yeah, so it's going to be a cruel summer. I guess that's another hint oh, yes, one of our songs. Get for fans aged 25 <laughs> to 34 who are trying to get their hands on sold-out tickets as they're most likely to be targeted. In some cases, fans have lost more than £1,000. Definitely not something many fans would have predicted in their wildest dreams. So, is this scam <laughs> ongoing or are we out of the woods? Uh, we're joined now by finance expert Kevin Mountford. Kevin, is this a problem that the Swifty, uh, the Swifties, <laughs> the Swifties can shake off? Well, I, I don't think the problem is limited to just Taylor Swift tickets. I mean, particularly with concerts, we've heard over the last 12 months other profile artists, whether it be Coldplay, Beyonce, Harry Styles, etc. Customers are always going to be targeted by frust uh, fraudsters, um, particularly where there's high demand. Um, but this carries on outside of just the entertainment industry. At Raisin, we carried out some research that shows that in quarter one this year, Brits have lost out on possibly over a billion pounds. Wow. And this stands across financial services and other products and services as well. But, you know, we live in an age where we're very much focused on kind of mobile and um, digital devices to live our lives. And with the rise of technology, things like artificial intelligence, etc. Mm. Fraudsters are getting more sophisticated, so we need to really keep our wits about us. And, Kevin, as they are getting more sophisticated, how do we remain scam-proof? Because they're just finding new ways to scam the public. So how do we stay one step ahead of the game? Well, I, I think the Taylor Swift issue was highlighted by Lloyds Banking Group, so that includes the likes of Halifax, Bank of Scotland, and they saw that they were being contacted by hundreds of customers, so that alerted them to the problem, and then they've communicated it accordingly. The research we carried out at, at Raisin shows that less than a third don't report, um, mm. or around a third don't report when they've been involved in a scam, either because they're not aware of it for quite a while, or there's the emotional aspect, we feel embarrassed or we feel angry. But it is important that we do feed this back to the vendors or the platforms, because then they can take action. I think with tickets, and I was after some tickets earlier this year, oh. hasten to add it wasn't Taylor Swift, but there was a huge <laughs> What was demand. it, Kevin? Well, OK, it was ACDC. <laughs> yeah, uh, good man. But, See, that's more my bag. Your team, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I managed Pearl Jam as well, so you can see my genre of music here. <laughs> but just with this ACDC situation, I was trying to get them in Seville, of all places, there was 100,000 people in the queue ahead of me. So you suddenly turn your attention to resale sites and then you look at the price. Mm. First, I'll be for money and you're saying that somebody's lost out at, say, £1,000. I'm guessing that's well above the face value. But then you start looking at reviews and the problem is your desperate need to get hold of something. You cut corners and that's what the fraudsters are relying on. So mm. we have to be vigilant. There is... Um, an onus on vendors and platforms to ensure they protect customers. And there are ways that you can get money back if you've been involved in fraudulent activity. Mm. But we have a responsibility. And we're also seeing from our research, something like 10% of those we asked 
have no security on their mobile and digital devices. So we're open to um, this kind of activity and we need to do everything we can to, to mitigate the risk. So this is not an isolated case. Mm. It is just something that we face in modern life. And we and the industry have to do everything we can to kind of mitigate the risk. And Kevin, isn't actually the case as well, aside from just fake tickets, uh, tickets being flogged, also you're getting touts who are hoovering up tickets as soon as they go on sale mm. at face value and selling them on for 10 times the amount. I got some tickets for my partner the other week for her birthday. It was Dua Lipa or someone, I don't oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I ended up paying something like, uh, like four or five times more than the face value from a third-party ticket website because the original ones were all sold out. Yeah, and, and, and as I say, I think, I mean, this has been a problem forever and a day, and there are certain kind of um, legislation that's put in place to try and, again, minimise the, the impact of this. And, and certainly from organisers' point of view, they try to limit the resale value. Some of these tickets as well that you're paying over the odds for, they might even be fake. So you need to familiarise yourself with what the original tickets look like, because the worst thing you want to do is pay over the odds and then get to the venue and you can't even access the concert or the event. So it is really important. But as I say, it comes down to supply and demand. So mm -hmm. there's always somebody to take advantage if people, you know, are desperate to get hold of the tickets. OK. Thanks, Fine, thanks Kevin. Back, Kevin. Thank you. I'll leave you to uh, go and enjoy some Thunderstruck or Highway to Hell. Or maybe yeah. some Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Kevin. <laughs> not, not... <laughs> Excellent. Right. Gosh. Next, uh, what are we doing next? We're going to be speaking to the marathon man, aren't we? The 63-year-old who's attempting his 120th marathon this weekend. Have you ever done a marathon? No. I, I want to do a walking marathon. I think I'll be better at That's that. That's cheating. That doesn't count. No, it's not cheating. That doesn't count. Every step counts. Well, this guy <laughs> coming up next, right? I'm looking forward to this. He believes that it's all down to one secret supplement. Can you guess what it is? We're going to find out shortly. This is Saturday Morning Live on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. This weekend will be dry for many of us. The best of the sunshine will be in the west, particularly through today. And across eastern areas, actually, there's going to be quite a cool feeling breeze with this northeasterly wind coming off the North Sea. That will bring some cloud to eastern areas through this morning. Elsewhere, though, it should stay dry and bright. However, as we head towards lunchtime, I think more in the way of cloud will bubble up across western areas, parts of Wales, into the Midlands as well. But it should stay dry through much of the day and it will feel fairly pleasant in the sunshine. Later on this evening, we'll start to see parts of Scotland to see some rain arrive as this area of rain pushes in from the north. That will bring thicker cloud to many areas of Scotland as well. And that area of cloud is going to sink southwards through this evening, covering many areas of northern England. And that will likely sit across parts of the Midlands, possibly into the southeast by Sunday morning. This drizzly rain will likely affect northern areas of England, southern Scotland as well, through Sunday morning as well. But it's going to be fairly light. But where the skies stay clear, it's going to be another chilly night tonight. We could see a touch of frost developing once again. As I said, there is a bit of uncertainty in how widespread this cloud will be. It could cover more southeastern areas. But as the day progresses, I think there'll be better chance of brighter spells developing, particularly across the south and the northwest, where it's actually going to be the warmest through the rest of the weekend. However, for this central slither, it will likely stay fairly dull and a little bit cooler for much of the day with a chance of some drizzly rain. Have a great day. Bye bye. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking, this is the nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 till 6pm on GB News, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, 10.47 with Ben and Steph on uh, Saturday Morning Live on GB News. Got where we were then. Oh, right. can you forget about me? No, never. <laughs> now listen, as we're in marathon season, I'm sure lots of you have been harassed by runners giving you their running tricks and tips over the past couple of months. Well, for many, the day has finally come as they take to the streets of the capital tomorrow to complete the gruelling, I think it's very gruelling, 26.2 mile race in the annual London Marathon. So our next guest is a bit of a warrior. He ran in the very first London Marathon in 1981 and is one of a select group, mostly in their 80s, Oof. still taking part in the race. Now in his early 60s, he puts his performances down to a secret ingredient. Can you guess what it is? It's black currant extract. Black currant extract. OK, yeah. let's get some more on this now by the man himself. <laughs> Delighted to be joined by uh, black currant advocate and marathon runner Mark Cleanthus. Mark. Tell us about the black current first of all. Mm -hmm. Why is it such a, uh, a good um, kick up the backside for you? Well, we're, we're all told about having um, our five green vegetables, colourful vegetables a day. But actually, it's the, uh, the purple berries, black currants, blueberries that we really need. They're high in polyphenols. They actually help um, us with our stress. They help us with um, recovery. They certainly help us uh, during a race. So they're like little mini sponges where they actually absorb and help us um, run that much quicker. And when I've used them in a race, um, I don't slow down as much at the end of the race. Uh, and differences can be between 5 and 10%. So for the average marathon runner, that could be 8, 12, 14 minutes. Mark, when did your love affair begin with black currant extracts? Where did it all begin with you? Um, well, I actually um, was studying how you can actually uh, have something that's natural, uh, performance enhancing during a during a um, endurance training, and um, and I started taking um, blueberries, black currants, but you had to have so many in a in a fruit bowl in the morning, <laughs> it, it would almost it would almost put you off. And then I discovered that you could use um, um, black currants, the black, uh, black currant extract from New Zealand, which is actually one of the finest um, black currants you can get around the world, purely because of the the ozone uh, is. It's quite thin there, mm. and so the black currants produce a much better skin to protect the black currant, and actually that helps the human body really. Got it. Okay, so black currants are the secret. Tell us about your marathons. You've done a hundred. Sorry, you're going to be doing your one hundred and twentieth, and your first. By the way, what's your quickest time? First of all, uh, my first, fastest time is two hours twenty four minutes and forty oh, wow, seconds. That's incredible. So that your first was in nineteen eighty one. When did you clock that time? The two hours. When was your best? Uh, that was four years later, actually. Um, I've got here the uh, official competitors, and if you can see it, 1981. Wow. Oh, you still got it. Amazing. Still got it, yeah. The London it's Marathon, still... 1981. Um, we've, we've got some clips, it... actually, of you from, from the first race. I don't know if we can get up on screen. So, oh, don't, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know when the last time you saw... That's that, not that's you, That's not Mark so Claire. That's You're not, not the one limping to the finish line, but it's yeah. you crossing over just there in the black vest top. Yeah, and can I just clarify? I was running up behind, but he collapses and he falls oh. on top of me. So, so was, um, he, was, yeah. was that guy just completely knackered, Mark? He needed some blackcurrant extract, I take it. Yeah, I wish I had blackcurrant extract. <laughs> I would have looked quite like that, really. Um, so what happened was um, the last couple of miles, I started to struggle a little bit because I, was, I hadn't heard of black blackcurrant then. And um, I was running along and he was just in front of me. And being the kind-hearted soul, I kept sort of trying to catch him up to help him just across the finish line. Um, and then at the last possible minute, he obviously had this last second win, third, probably the 15th win he had, and he just lunged towards the finish line. And then he sort of slowed down, so I, I ran in front of him. It didn't... It looked like I'm taking no prisoners, but actually, I, had he stumbled, I'd have helped him. We were so close to the finish line that I was... Are you, are you him. mates with him now? Have, have you spoken to him since? Since. I, I did meet him oh, quite a few years ago, actually, but he's given up running now. He, uh, I think that was uh, <laughs> him off, to be honest. He just does part runs like me, but um, 
Got it. So, but, uh, Mark, but, yeah, the Mike, sense of achievement you got. The, the crowds weren't the crowds weren't that great really in the first year because no one had really knew about it. Um, you had a one in two chance of um, entering. So eight thousand uh, ran. There's me crossing with a black singlet on. And uh, there was so there was about eighteen twenty thousand applied for eight thousand places. So you had a one in two chance of um, getting in the London Marathon for for tomorrow's race, twenty twenty four. There's an astonishing five hundred and sixty thousand people applied, mm. uh, and that's probably only for around twenty thousand of the fifty thousand runners. And Mark, uh, the other thirty, <laughs> the other thirty thousand are for charity places and elite runners and and the like, really. And Mark, what's really impressive is your fastest time is only 20 minutes over the world record champion. Now that you're in your 60s, I just love that, you know what, no matter how old you are, you can take part in the marathon. What keeps you going to, like, just keep on pushing to that finish line? Is it the crowds or what are you telling yourself in your head as you're running every single mile? Um, I go back to when I was 10 and my school teacher told me that he said, Mark, when I finished last in a school bus cross country race, Mark, you'll never ever run a marathon. And I just dismissed it. Well, I've just run around this school field three times. It feels like a marathon to me. <laughs> in reality, it was only probably half a mile. Um, and then completely forgot about the moment. 10 years later, I heard about the first London marathon, entered the first uh, London, got in. Um, and I was about 20 miles when you normally hit the wall. I was really struggling. And I was thinking, I, I can't finish this. I have to give up. And knowing that you, with your race number, you could get free free travel to the finish line or all day long in London. I thought, well, I, I, um, but you could physically at that stage, you couldn't get across the barriers. There's too many spectators. So I just trumbled along a little bit. And then I saw my brother and I gave him a bit of a hug. And he said, go on, you can do it. You're looking strong. And I'm thinking... <laughs> I don't feel strong. <laughs> so um, anyway, I carried on probably for half a mile and I was just about to walk. And I had a flashback from my teacher saying, Mark, and Good I, stuff. Hadn't thought, I hadn't thought about it in training. I hadn't thought about it the night before the race. Yeah. Mark, we're going to... Mark, we're going to have to stop you there because we're running out of time. But look, good luck tomorrow. Let best. us know what your time okay. is. And I'm going to Google yeah, so some we'll black neck track for myself. So, yep. good man. Okay. Thanks, good Mark. Good luck. Stay with us. Lots more to come, including showbiz. We're back in a few minutes. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. This weekend will be dry for many of us. The best of the sunshine will be in the west, particularly through today. And across eastern areas, actually, there's going to be quite a cool feeling breeze with this northeasterly wind coming off the North Sea. That will bring some cloud to eastern areas through this morning. Elsewhere, though, it should stay dry and bright. However, as we head towards lunchtime, I think more in the way of cloud will bubble up across western areas, parts of Wales, into the Midlands as well. But it should stay dry through much of the day and it will feel fairly pleasant in the sunshine. Later on this evening, we'll start to see parts of Scotland to see some rain arrive as this area of rain pushes in from the north. That will bring thicker cloud to many areas of Scotland as well. And that area of cloud is going to sink southwards through this evening, covering many areas of northern England. And that will likely sit across parts of the Midlands, possibly into the southeast by Sunday morning. This drizzly rain will likely affect northern areas of England, southern Scotland as well, through Sunday morning as well. But it's going to be fairly light. But where the skies stay clear, it's going to be another chilly night tonight we could see a touch of frost developing once again. As I said, there is a bit of uncertainty in how widespread this cloud will be. It could cover more southeastern areas. But as the day progresses, I think there'll be better chance of brighter spells developing, particularly across the south and the northwest, where it's actually going to be the warmest through the rest of the weekend. However, for this central slither, it will likely stay fairly dull and a little bit cooler for much of the day with a chance of some drizzly rain. Have a great day. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. We're GB News and we come from a proud tradition of British journalism. That's why I'm so excited to be here. It's something so new. The first news channel to be launched in Britain in over 30 years. Launched to represent the views of the British people. To go where other broadcasters refuse to go. How did you find out about the story in the first place? Launched with one aim. To be the fearless champion of Britain. It's an absolutely fantastic atmosphere here. This is GB News. The 
GB News, Britain's news channel. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. We're GB News, and we come from a proud tradition of British journalism. That's why I'm so excited to be here. It's something so new. The first news channel to be launched in Britain in over 30 years. Launched to represent the views of the British people. To go where other broadcasters refuse to go. How did you find out about the story in the first place? Launched with one aim. To be the fearless champion of Britain. It's an absolutely fantastic atmosphere here. This is GB News. The People's Channel! GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Very good morning to you. It's Ben Leo here alongside Steph Tetchy, and this is Saturday Morning Live. It's so great to have your company this morning. We have an action-packed second hour for you. We do indeed. All the day's top stories with Olympian and broadcaster Chris Akabusi, and she's been hired again, apprentice winner and entrepreneur Marnie Swindles. <laughs> And also, we've got a bit of royal news for you. Prince Harry has now officially listed the US as his primary residence. And what's the latest with Megan, Meghan's new lifestyle friend? Sarah Louise Robertson will join us to talk about that and plus Prince, Prince William's first engagement since the Princess of Wales cancer diagnosis. And finally today, we're going to be joined by an amazing Greatest Britain who's raising awareness of breast cancer in men by taking part in a charity fashion show. And don't forget, we want to hear from you. We would love to hear what you think. Send your views and post your comments by visiting gbnews.com slash your say. But before we get stuck into all those stories, Cameron Walker has your news headlines. Thanks both. Good morning. It's one minute past 11. I'm Cameron Walker here in the GB newsroom. The Metropolitan Police has had to apologise for an earlier apology over a comment made to an anti-Semitism campaigner. Gideon Falter was stopped from crossing a road near a pro-Palestine march in London after an officer described him as openly Jewish. 
An initial apology from the force caused offence for suggesting opponents must know their presence is provocative. The Home Office, which has described the incident as unacceptable, has written to the police commissioner and mayor of London. Shadow Policing Minister Alex Norris told GB News that there's no place for hate. The Met Police have now accepted it's wrong, so that's, you know, that is a good thing. You know, it isn't for politicians to do operational policing, as you know. You know, police must feel that they can uh, uh, keep safe and to organise these types of uh, public events in a way that is safe. However, it must, you know, there can be no place for hate in this. And if there is racism, in this case, anti-Semitism, there cannot be that sort of thing. Three people who died in a car crash near a retail park in northwest London have been named by police. Mohamed Zaidani, Mohamed Ghazi and Sohail Zufika, all in their early 20s, died when their vehicle crashed through a car park fence hitting a footbridge. It happened last weekend and the men were pronounced dead at the scene. It's understood two other passengers in the vehicle were injured, but their condition is not life-threatening. Investigation into the cause of the crash continue. A man who set himself alight outside the New York court where former President Donald Trump's hush money trial is being held has died. Maxwell Azarello was taken to hospital in a critical condition and later died from his injuries. Witnesses say he pulled pamphlets with conspiracy theories out of a backpack and then threw them in the air before dousing himself with a flammable liquid. Police said he did not appear to be targeting Trump or others involved in the trial. The former president's campaign has released a statement offering its condolences. Witness Fred Gates describes what happened. I was skeptical at first. I thought it, it was a gag, like he was going to... I didn't think he was going to actually light himself on fire. Um, but when it seemed to, it, it seemed like he had real purpose, everybody started to run away from him. And then that's when he went up. In other news, fire has caused significant damage to a historic pub in southwest London. Thick black smoke was seen rising from the Grade 2 listed building in Mitcham. 80 firefighters battled the blaze, which ripped through three floors and destroyed the roof of the derelict property. Four men were treated at the scene. The cause of the fire is being investigated. A whistleblower claims the Conservative Party was warned that MP Mark Menzies' alleged misuse of campaign funds may have constituted fraud, but there was no duty to report it. The filed MP lost the Conservative whip and was suspended as one of the Prime Minister's trade envoys after The Times published claims he used political donations to cover medical expenses and pay off bad people who had locked him in a flat. Mr Menzies disputes the allegations. The party says it has been looking into the claims for several months and Lancashire police are reviewing the available information. A two-minute silence has been held honouring the English men and women who died serving the nation. These are live pictures you're seeing now from the Cenotaph in central London, marking 130 years of the Royal Society of St George. Hundreds of cadets are taking part in the events. Chairman Nick Dutt says it's important young people are proud of their country. We're trying to get the younger people involved um, in what we do. Patriotism has taken a hit over the last few years. Um, and it tends to be a lot of older people who are involved. So the importance of getting younger people involved and taking part in this is critical to us, I believe. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Steph and Ben. Next Tuesday, on 23rd of April, it's St George's Day. Today, to celebrate all things English, and he is, of course, our English patron saint. Yes, but celebrations have already started this weekend. The Royal Society of St George is marking its 130th anniversary. And, Steph, there, yeah. was, a, there was a big debate this week about St George. Yeah. Uh, Scotland has a uh, bank holiday yeah. for St Andrew, their patron saint. I think Wales has one for, is it St David? Yeah, but and Ireland has one for St Patrick, right? Got it. Yeah. Why don't we have one for we St George? We so anymore? need one for St George's. But it's weird because I feel like the day tends to escape me a bit because I don't really hear a big fuss about it. No. You know, on the day it just, it just goes over my head a bit. Well, do it... you do anything to mark the day? 
I, I admittedly don't know, so I'm, I'm a bit of a hypocrite calling you just for, want the bank for holiday. Bank holiday St George would actually pass us well, but, yeah, without much of a whimper. But look, Will Hollis, he's down live at the parade near the Cenotaph in central London. So, Will, what's been happening? What's the atmosphere like down there? Well, for more than a hundred years, the Cenotaph in central London has been used as the focal point for when Britain remembers its fallen service men and women. But it's also used at times of significant, significant national um, celebrations, such as St George, which, as you say, is next Tuesday. I'm just going to move to the side here because there are hundreds of cadets here who are marking the anniversary of the 100th and 30th uh, anniversary of the Royal. Society of St George. You can just hear right now some of the dignitaries are making speeches. There's just been a two-minute silence here in the Cenotaph, but you can see that there are hundreds of uh, sea cadets, air cadets, as well as army cadets. And one of the things that we often hear when we do talk about St George, particularly at times like this, is that young people are indifferent to our patron saints, but that is clearly not the case here. We've just been speaking to Nick Dutt, the chairman of the Royal Society of St George and he says this is an inspiration for the hope of the nation seeing how people can be so prideful of our national patron saint while also honouring the servicemen and women who have given their lives fighting to defend England and Britain. The Royal Society for St George is a patriotic society but it is non-political and it is welcoming of all people from different faiths and backgrounds but it says that is ultimately promoting England English values and Englishness, values of tolerance, freedom of speech and democracy. And that's what you can see here today, ahead of St George's Day, which is, of course, on Tuesday. Thanks, Will. Great stuff. Apparently, uh, the Welsh don't have a bank holiday for St Ooh. David. Oh. Were you aware of that? Well, who knows? It might change one day if they want it. Well, maybe they need one, maybe we need one, and we should all have an extra bank holiday. And <laughs> any excuse, any excuse. Well, thanks, Will, for that. Now, to look through the top stories of today, we're delighted to be joined by Olympian and broadcaster Chris Akabusi, an apprentice winner and entrepreneur Marnie Swindles. Thanks, guys, for joining us again. <laughs> yeah, good to see you no, again. Well done on the first thing. Thank you. Well. We're going to be talking about the rise of Brotox. So this is about men turning to cosmetic treatments to stay youthful. Now, Chris, you're <laughs> aging, like fine wine. You are ageing like fine wine. Well, yeah, so look at the article. I'm surprised. So, so these guys don't know. I don't understand. I don't watch a lot of TV. But you, you will know these guys, mate. Liam Payne, yeah. Barry Kiernan, yeah. Kiernan, and Killian Murphy. Yes. Liam Payne. He's about what twenty eight or something. What does he the need stress to stress? Well, these are examples of young men <laughs> yeah. that are getting themselves injected with fillers and Botox yeah. and all sorts of stuff. To what? I don't really? actually have know. To keep up appearances, Marnie. I disagree. I think more power to them. I think yeah. men spend a lot of time being told what they should do, what they shouldn't do. They should be yeah. more manly. They should care more. Yeah. I think if they want to invest in their looks and their appearance, then they should. I think looking good, feeling confident is as valuable to men as it is women. So more power to them. That's well, I don't think you look good to feel confident. I, you know, you know I, I, many things, but looking good is not my style. But yeah. I feel confident. You know, I, you know, I've lived on this earth. I've done great stuff. Mm. I've got a wonderful yeah. family. So my confidence is not in social acceptance view of what do you look like, a Kapusi? No, it's the stuff that I've done and the people in my life. So, you know, I don't want to bow. This the problem is this. This is Madison Avenue and the, the equivalent in the UK creating a way you've got to be in feminisation. But, that's, but that's, that's you imparting what you deem as confidence. There's, yeah. there's, there's people that source confidence from different ways. Wearing a nice tailored suit, having mm. your hair nice. I think polished shoes, you know, nice jewellery. I think from, from that, men, that is, but, that is an element of empowerment. Is that inner directed or outer directed, though? Uh, so, so I'm talking about confidence that comes from your internal direction. I, I think that comes from within as well. I think, I Chris, know. you've got a great point. When you're truly liberated and you just mm. don't care what people think about you, your confidence shines through and you just look better, you feel better. Uh, Actually, the, the British College of, of Aesthetic Medicine, they say that men are now one in every 
uh, five Botox customers. But so it's, and it's increasing as well. Despite hefty price tags, I think three, four hundred pound a pop. But I think it's so hard in this world of social media where everything is so transparent and the first thing people do these days, Ben, I think, is they judge you by your looks. Ooh. That's the first thing. Oh, what, you got something there? No, I've got it because I've never, I've never had Botox. He can't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> is, your, is your filler slipping? Is your... <laughs> oh, no, my eyebrows Are you down. viewing? Oh. Now, I've got all sorts of laughter lines and stuff yeah. and it's, it's a signs of ageing and, and a great life. Uh, life is, is character. I think, yeah. who, who are we to judge if... if, if Botox makes someone feel good. If extensions makes a girl feel good, mm -hmm. who, who are we to judge? Let people live on. And I do think, I know what you mean about this outwardly sourced confidence or inwardly yeah. sourced, but I think how you look at the mirror and what you see, you know, if, if you're benefited by putting on makeup or, you know, more power to mm -hmm. you. So uh, I'm seeing the equation between vanity and sanity. Ooh. And I'm thinking to no, myself, no. if you go down that road, every day you're going to be like, oh, no, they don't like my lines. Oh, I need this, I need that, I need this. No, because that's the difference. I, I'm not suggesting that this is an, an external presence forcing men to go and get Botox. I'm saying okay. that if men look okay. at themselves in the mirror and think, you know what, <laughs> I want to invest in myself, I want to, I want to sort that line out, that's been bothering me then why not? Who are we to judge? Okay. All right, well, I'm going to get on to yeah. my uh, local Harley Street Botox uh, expert oh. after the show. No, Ben, you're looking cool, mate. You don't need anything. Um, let's move on to another story. Jo Brand, the comedian, she's expressed concern that she's going to be cancelled, so she relies on her influencer daughter to guide her through the culture wars, uh, and she says that she advises her on what language and views are no longer acceptable. She describes herself as the voice of the nation. Mm. Uh, shouldn't Jo... Going back to what you just said, Chris, about not really caring what people think, Think. Why yeah. are people like Joe Brand so scared of being cancelled? Why don't you just live your authentic self? Because cancel culture is real. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, no, but you're in. spot on. You spot cancel culture is real. So I remember Joe Brand when she came around first time in the 80s and 90s. Mm. Acerbic, quick witted, one liners, put you down. I mean, she mm. was brilliant. Um, and she just spoke her truth, right? Um, but she's saying now, 30 years on, Generation Z, who are much more socially aware, there's a, a language that changes and a way of presenting yourself, she's petrified that she's... And that, even, even saying Joe Band and petrification, that just doesn't compute, cos she was so out there back then. But she's got a, a daughter mm -hmm. who's uh, Gen Z, who That's says, Mum, you can't say that, mate. You can't... <laughs> well, not that, but, mate, but, Mum, you can't say that. And so she... So when I, like, when I do my speaking, when I first started speaking, self-deprecation was the key. And when you come up on stage... <laughs> You've got to self-deprecate yourself, <laughs> so you, you pull yourself down and say, OK, now let me tell you a story. Yeah. But now, you, 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 you can't, you can't self-deprecate because you're affecting other people in the audience. What do you mean? So, anyway, I won't go any further on that one, but you've got to be careful. I well, does, does, does Lord Sugar, is he big on cancellation? Has he ever uh, talked about... Yeah. He, he, he is what care. he is, and he appears as he is, and no-one will tell him any different. Yeah. I think that's the right way to be. I think we need to cancel cancel culture. But shouldn't we I... be keeping up with the times? No, like, no, you've no. you worked hard for your career. I think that... To say the wrong thing, it goes to dust. No, because, is again, going it? back to the story earlier, the onus isn't on me to protect everybody's feelings. I think mm. I'm as entitled to speak my truth as... As, as people are to theirs, and I shouldn't have to compromise the way I see the world to protect someone else from it. Mm. I think diversity of opinion is the root of yeah. all yeah. progress. Mm. If, yeah. if, you, if you take that away from us, what do we have? But you have to admit, we're quite sensitive as a society. We are, and I'm not, I'm not advocating that we should be disrespectful and rude and go out of our way to, to upset people. What my mum says is, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, but I mm. think we absolutely have to protect at all costs. And Joe Brand should lean into it, mm -hmm. the idea that we should speak <laughs> truth. And do you know what? Joe Brand is at no risk of getting cancelled. She threatened to throw battery acid as a joke <laughs> over Nigel Farage. notoriously, <laughs> and she kept her job. People have done uh, much... Uh, you know, yes. much uh, less, lesser crimes and mm. been cancelled for it. So, Joe Brand, you're very safe. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and, Marnie, you haven't held back your thoughts on the latest <laughs> Apprentice winner. Well, the claws are out. Well, no, this, is, this has taken me by surprise. <laughs> I think people love to pit 
match us against each other. Yeah. I have nothing but well wishes and full respect to the new Apprentice winner, but, Rachel. I know yeah. the sun said that I'd taken a swipe at her. Yeah, so I had what about did you Rachel say? being hired. Uh, yeah. oh, I didn't. I, they said, do you see her as a threat? And I said, no, I don't think she's a threat. She's in a different part of the UK. My focus at Bronx is on boxing. Hers is on, on different oh, elements two of fitness. fitness. Brands. Come on. We will survive and we will be with me and Lord Sugar on our journey, her and Lord Sugar on their journey. Mm. We will excel in our different ways. And be I, I love that Lord Sugar's now uh, getting involved in fitness brands. And he went from I, cakes to fitness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's worried about getting cancelled. Yeah. We, we've got a clip actually of. Uh, is this your gym here? This is the, the gym. Box. Yes. There you go. It's it's all about being more than boxing. Um, yeah. It's not just about six packs and fitness. It is about that sense of community, that energy that you see there, and bringing mm. people together. Um, boxing clubs are these incredible places. There's magic in there. People Shall just we remind it. ourselves of the yeah. moment you got hired? Oh, yeah. Marnie, you are going to be my business partner. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Congratulations. How does it feel seeing that now? Oh, incredible. I mean, it's been a full year. This Wednesday on the 24th of April, we're launching our second floor, which is actually where Amazing. all Lord Sugar's investment has gone. So it's a real full circle moment for me has this week. Has he come in for a session? He has been in. I would love he to has see been Lord in. Sugar in the ring. He hasn't been in the ring or in gloves yet, <laughs> but he has been in the gym and, yeah, he's he's excited. I think he might be coming to the launch as well. Who, who's Lord Sugar got beef with? Is it Jeremy Clarkson or um, is it... Who Pitt hasn't Morgan? he got beef with? <laughs> Piers Morgan, Donald Trump. Um, but that's what I love about Lord Sugar is he... he he has no hairs or graces. He says it as is, and I think the world would be a much more straightforward place if people thought you like need, him. You need to get um, the boss in with, uh, you know, Jeremy Clarkson or something for a, a match. In <laughs> there the was a moment where Piers Morgan was talking about boxing, and I sort of nudged Lord Sugar and said, uh, <laughs> "Should we, Ding should we make it happen?" <laughs> That's why you're an apprentice. Wouldn't yeah. You? Chris, what do you do to stay fit these days? Well, I've stopped running oh. to stay fit. Because what I was finding running out in the woods, I was twisting my old bones and ankles and I can't go to the golf course. Yeah. So I just yeah. play golf. That's how I keep myself you know what? Walking is so underrated. Oh, yes, you, absolutely. You, burn, you still burn... Say you do 10,000 steps, which is about, uh, I think it's about 5K. You still burn around five, 600 calories, which is a decent amount. Yeah. And yet you're not kind of, like, left starving or, um, you, know, in, you know, just... When you do, like, a hit session, for example, high-intensity interval training, at the end of it, I could devour a cow, like, <laughs> about 10 tonnes of pasta. But by, when you walk, you don't really get that same... But hold of, like, on, Ben. Earlier on, when I said I wanted to do a walking marathon, you said that would be cheating, and now you're saying, oh, no, it's actually quite good. That's different. You Eat can't, you can't walk a marathon. <laughs> but I tell you what, that a walking marathon, that's a lot tougher than you Thank think. Thank you. Really? Oh, my gosh. I, I remember when the, when, the, when, when, when the Channel Tunnel opened, we, had to, we walked from um, Dover to Calais, 22 miles <laughs> under the... You did? Uh, uh, yeah, and I'm telling you what... When I finished, I was cream cracking. Absolutely, <laughs> everything seized up. So Ben, We've don't knock it. Pen. That yeah. is a tough gig. <laughs> All right, maybe sounds charity. like a deal. The most I've done is a five k, and I've done, I, I just find running so boring. But I did a park run. <laughs> Is it park run? Yeah, park run. Yeah, exactly. it's 5K yeah. park run. I've got 20 minutes 20, which apparently is quite good. Yeah. See, that's, see the park runs, they were fun when they were just fun runs. But now, look, you, I've got my time, I've got my number. I feel like no, everybody you'll be is racing. running right now. Everyone yeah. is having this, like, crisis of wanting to run yeah. and do marathons. <laughs> 5K. Yeah. It's good. It's, it's just good that you go out and you used to do your run. You always just go out and do your run. Forget about the time. It's good you one foot in front of another. Enjoy the ambiance. Or do you boxing? Or do, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but there's so much for running. There's the ambience, there's the sounds, sounds, the smells, the whole environment, the ethos in the uh, arena. That's what you should do when you're running. Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying earlier about exercise in general. For me, some people don't get it, but the endorphin rush is just like... Yeah, it's, it's so it's great. good. I mean, it's better good for anything. mental health. Unfortunately, we don't have no time for fry-ups. And I really <laughs> have to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> a good fry-up right now, seriously. But thank you so much for joining yes, us did, today. Chris, yes, thank you. Right, still to come, we're going to be joined by showbiz journalist Eddie Phillips to get the latest celeb news. But up next, Meghan Markle sending jars of strawberry jam on, out to influencers. We'll get the latest from Royal commentator Sarah Louise Robertson. This is Saturday Morning Live on GB News's, on GB News, Britain's news channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. In every corner of the world, people celebrate English tradition and values as members of the Royal Society of St George. 
Yet here in England, branches are closing as membership dwindles. I feel that in this country, St George is all but dead and buried. Until recently, Stephen Warden from Wigston was president of the Leicestershire branch. Despite spending £1,500 of his own money advertising, he couldn't find enough members to keep it running. I did everything humanly possible to get new members into the branch from the local environment, but they were just not interested in joining. He thinks changing demographics and declining interest in the society's values contributed to disappearing membership. But he also blames political leadership at national and local levels. Stephen claims his proposal for a St George's Day parade was repeatedly rejected by Leicester City Council over 10 years. A celebration is planned for St George's Day, but like most cities and towns, no parade will pass through the streets. A Leicester City Council spokesperson said, Leicester's annual celebrations of St George's Day have been organised and funded by the City Council for many decades and they remain an important part of the city's festival calendar. Some in Leicester say they would like to see more done to celebrate England's patron saint. I think it's a sign of patriotism. I think it helps the country. We celebrate a lot of religious festivals here. People forget, I think, uh, what is important to England. Maybe it's been sort of... Um jumped onto with the wrong crowd, but I think nowadays it's just completely different. Back in Wigston, St George's Cross flies above Stephen's home. It makes me feel good because I know at least I've not forgotten St George if everybody else has. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. All right, it's been another busy week uh, as far as the royal family is concerned, with Harry and Meghan again, uh, of course, who else, making the headlines across the pond. It was revealed this week that Prince Harry has officially changed his primary residence to the US. I'm not surprised. The Sussexes have lived in California since they stepped back as working royals in 2020. And it all comes, of course, as Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, launched the first product in her new, influ <laughs> her new influencer range, American Riviera Orchard, sending out PR packages with strawberry jam inside. Back here at home, though, the Prince of Wales has had his first engagement on Thursday since the, since the Princess of Wales announced her cancer diagnosis. OK, well, joining us now to get the latest in all this royal shenanigans is showbiz uh, commentator Sarah Louise Robertson. Thank you for joining us. Good yes, morning to you. So, morning. lots going on. William's out and about doing the royal duties, you know, getting on with it yeah. whilst uh, the Princess of Wales is ill. Harry, meanwhile, uh, and Meghan. I mean, what's this jam about? Let's start with the jam. Yeah. Oh, the jam. Well, they've got themselves into a bit of a sticky mess. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually ended up being a bonus for King Charles, who's never had to do anything. So Megan's launched her new lifestyle range, starting with jams. It's yeah. called American Riviera Orchard. Apparently, it's been made by organic from organic fruits growing in Megan and Harry's Montecito mm. Gardens. If we can believe it, I, yeah. I reserve an air of scepticism <laughs> on on that. Um, I'm sure there's probably something else going on behind the mm. scenes. But she sent out 50 jars of this jam to influencers and celebrity friends mm. in the hope of trying to boost yeah. some sales to, to her product. Yeah. But it's ended up winning for King Charles because <laughs> fans have gone to Highgrove website <laughs> and King Charles's jam 
has sold out so across what, what, the board. Yes. So Megan's not feeling so jammy then. She's not feeling so jammy. <laughs> All she's done is serve, serve a girl to King Charles, her father-in-law, and he'd be obviously loving this. So why did they go? Gone through the roof. Why did him. they go to the Highgrove website? Well, I think it's a bit of a, a blow against Megan because they're saying we don't want your jam. Oh. We're yeah. going to go and get the king. So it just shows how popular the king is. Do, Sarah, are you feeling optimistic about Megan's lifestyle brand? Because you know they've tried many things. They've done the documentary. She's done the podcast everything Megan does gets slated so yes. how are you feeling about this brand Pre because it seems like she wants world domination here. this is this is what she's always wanted her, her dream has been to be like this Gwyneth Paltrow style lifestyle guru mm. she's always loved Gwyneth's website goop when she set up the TIG which was her website when mm -hmm. she was still in suits as a working actress that was the the brand st the style of brand that she was going for was this Gwyneth style um, New York elite very Princessy. Mm. That that was the thing that she wanted to do. So this is her chance now by trying to cash in on her royal title mm -hmm. because she is now a duchess. So she's using that to, yep. to try and elevate her brand. And she's really now trying to carve out herself as this new Martha Stewart. And she's coming out with the cooking show as and well. She's on coming Netflix. out with the cooking show. And she's. I mean, to be fair to Megan, she has always tried to say that she's she's into healthy eating, organic mm -hmm. food, cooking. Apparently, Prince Harry famously proposed when they were just roasting a chicken. Oh, as, she, as she puts it back then. But I don't see this being a success. Yeah. It just will not happen for her because she's just burnt too many bridges yeah. with what's gone on with the royal family. Mm -hmm. And I think now people just don't believe in, in her brand. They don't think she's authentic. Mm. So, you mm. know, they're like saying, well, what are you, Megan? Are you an actress? Are you a guru? Yeah. Are you a duchess? Are you a Who philanthropist? Who are you, Megan? Who actually are you? Yeah. This is what we're asking. Yeah. I don't think anyone knows. I don't think Megan really knows who she is. <laughs> But, you know, she's trying to carve out some sort of, like, Princess Diana-style identity. Yeah. And everything she touches, it just doesn't work. And we saw what happened with Netflix as yeah. well. They've obviously given her this show, but this really is her last chance yeah. to, to make her mark and carve out a new niche for herself. But I what, can't see it taking off. What's going on with a uh, Harry Styles? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. Meanwhile, oh. Prince Harry... Oh, I was going to say Prince he's Harry, He's saying yes. now there's no going back for Sorry, him. Prince Harry. I was, yes, I was <laughs> going to say Harry Styles. I'm not... I, I, I I'm wasn't, talking I about Harry Styles today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can was, if you want. <laughs> I wasn't holding my breath that Prince Harry was going to return to the UK on a full-time basis, but this week it's been official that he is living the American dream. So what's happened here? Well, this is Prince Harry, the prodigal son. Is he going to return? Is he not? Mm. Unfortunately... Well, actually, I don't think it is, unfortunately. He's decided that his main residence is the United States. Now, this was decision was made last year on the 29th of June, which was the day that they officially left Frogmore as their royal yeah. residence. And he decided that the US was his main residence. Now, he's not gone for US citizenship. Yep. There's been discussions about that. He was asked about this on a US chat show recently. He fudged the answer. Because what I'd like to say is, if, if yep. Prince Harry did become a US citizen, he would we'll no longer be titles. Prince Harry. He'd lose his titles. He would have to renounce all of that. Mm. He is not going to do that. Megan is not going to allow him to do that. They know what side yeah. their bread's buttered. Mm -hmm. And why would he cut off yeah. being in the line of succession to be a US citizen? Do you think it's the right thing for them to do, to give up their titles? I think... Actually, King Charles should strip them of their titles because this really is him insulting his father and insulting the royal family and insulting us, the British taxpayer, who've paid God knows how much money for their wedding, millions and millions of pounds, through that huge wedding for them, all the rest of it. And Harry's just really sticking a finger up to, to us and saying, ha-ha, you know, I'm a US resident now. He's just this pampered elitist prince who's out of touch. The Americans aren't happy about it. They don't want him because he insulted their First Amendment mm. and called it bonkers. Yeah. Um, is, is, is working there, behind the scenes is there with any, Katie Couric to try and get that overturned. Is there any significance in the date he chose to officially list his residence in yes. the US? Because that was the day that his father booted him out of Frogmore Cottage. Yes, that's what I'm saying. He lost, yeah. he lost his residence, yeah. So it was, it was a real temper tantrum. It was throwing his toys out of the pram and yeah. going, I'll show you then. Mm. So he said, again, this is what the Sussex, Sussexes do. They, they sort of try and... 
threaten the king, mm. you know, and yeah. manipulate him emotionally. It's, it's emotional blackmail, emotional manipulation. It really is. To say, you know, because Charles doesn't want to lose Harry. At the end of the day, regardless of what's gone on, it's still his... They're still family. Uh, they're still family. Well. And so, you know, he... And then Harry knows this, and it's like praying, tugging on the heartstrings yeah. of, of his father, mm -hmm. of his father's goodwill. Now, when William comes on the throne, <laughs> those Ooh. strings and ties oh, that's will That's going to be a whole new season William of The Crown. Is so hard. He will have oh. none of this. He right. will just axe them. Um, yeah, so at the moment, Harry's still got a way in with, with his family. Okay. Through, Sarah Louise, through through Royal Commentator. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you much, so much for joining Thank us you. today. Thanks. Cameron Walker's on standby with your news headlines. Cameron. It's 11.30. I'm Cameron Walker in the GB newsroom. The Metropolitan Police has had to apologise for an earlier apology over a comment made to an anti-Semitism campaigner. Gideon Falter was stopped from crossing a road near a pro-Palestine march in London after an officer described him as openly Jewish. An initial apology from the force caused offence for suggesting opponents must know their presence is provocative. The Home Office, which has described the incident as unacceptable, has written to the police Commissioner and the Mayor of London. Three men who died in a car crash near a retail park in northwest London have been named by police as Mohammed Zaydani, Mohammed Ghazi, and Sahail Zufika. Their vehicle went through a car park fence before hitting a footbridge. The victims, all in their 20s, died at the scene. Two other passengers were injured, but their condition is not life threatening. Maxwell Azzarello, named as the man who has set himself alight outside the court where Donald Trump's hush money trial is being held, has died. Police say he did not appear to be targeting the former president or anyone else involved in the trial. Trump's campaign has released a statement offering its condolences. A two-minute silence has been held honouring the English men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice serving the nation. These are live pictures you're seeing from the Cenotaph in central London, where hundreds of cadets are taking part in an event marking 130 years of the Royal Society of St George. For the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com forward slash alerts. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat because she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat because I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better as 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently told a podcast, diabetes have gone through the roof. And you should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room, um, if you'll forgive the, <laughs> forgive the phraseology there. And actually, sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at a reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded them in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse, uh, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active. Every hour. 
We're GB News, and we come from a proud tradition of British journalism. That's why I'm so excited to be here. It's something so new. The first news channel to be launched in Britain in over 30 years. Launched to represent the views of the British people. To go where other broadcasters refuse to go. How did you find out about the story in the first place? Launched with one aim. To be the fearless champion of Britain. It's an absolutely fantastic atmosphere here. This is GB News. The People's Channel! GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Bev Turner. Thank you for joining us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's time now for my favourite part of the show. <laughs> it's time for your weekly dose of showbiz no news. And we're delighted to be joined by the fab Ellie <laughs> Phillips, who's in the studio with us. Hi, guys. Hi. Morning. Very okay. good to be here. <laughs> I've got to start off with the big news of the week. Oh, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. Taylor Swift. Um, in true Taylor style, she doesn't do things as she normally would. So she dropped her album, her new album, at midnight on Thursday night, mm -hmm. moving into Friday morning, called The Torture Poets Department. And then two hours later, followed up with part two. I know. 31 Th tracks all together, right? 31 tracks. Hang on, so two albums. Two yeah. Yeah, like a part one and a part two. So the second bit's called the anthology, um, but they do run together. So when you listen to them, if you put it on Spotify or whatever you're listening on, it, it flows as one. Wow. It's like 31 tracks. And I'm not going to lie, mm -hmm. they're all really good. They really are. They're really good. Like, if there's not one dud, they're all great. And she's actually put out a message when she released it saying um, basically that, the, 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 that what she's included in the album, kind of the lyrics, the meaning, yeah. they reflect events that have happened. Mm -hmm. It's past tense. Yeah. And she pointedly says, there's nothing to avenge, no scores yeah. to settle. That's over. The chapter is closed. But no stone has been left unturned, Ellie, because, you know, there's rumours that she's tried, made a diss song about Kim Kardashian. Yeah. Apparently, some of her former flames have yeah. been mentioned. I so... don't think we're shocked about the former flame thing, because that is very <laughs> Taylor Swift. Does. That's just her yeah. thing. You know, if you're dating Taylor Swift, you're going to be in a song. <laughs> so we know that a couple of the songs are likely to be about recent flames, like Matt mm. Healy, uh, Joe Alwyn. But the Kim Kardashian thing is interesting. And the, the, the reason people are picking up on this particular there's a song um called um thank you amy yeah and she's capitalized the k the i and the m so it's written kind of like <laughs> dodgy text speak <laughs> and it basically spells out kim so what, what's her problem with kim so yeah. this, this, the, the song essentially is about bullying and about how she doesn't like bullies and she says in it oh it'll be funny that at some point your child is going to be Goodness singing to my thing. song and yeah. not realizing it's about you and we all know that Kim Kardashian's daughter, North, has previously done TikTok dances and sung along to other Taylor Swift wow. songs. The reason they fell out originally was back in um, 2007, I think it was. Um, Kanye West, who is Kim Kardashian's ex-husband, stormed the stage when Taylor Swift won the VMA for Best Video and he kicked off. Should have gone to Beyonce. He, you know, took it from her. Got it. Hoo-ha. And so now this is her... Right, come on, then. She's got so many songs. Yeah. What's your favourite and what's your favourite? Sorry, My one is Shake It Off. Okay. Yeah. Oh, in general? Yeah. I think, yeah, shake it off, because yeah. it's, it, it, it's good for all situations, I've isn't it? I've seen like... Taylor perform live in um, concert, and she's just incredible. She is an amazing yeah. showwoman. She deserves all the success she I also gets. like Look What You Made Me Do, because it's so sassy. Yeah. She's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> And there's quite a few songs on, on the album a bit like that. The album overall is kind of very heartbroken, I would say. A lot of it is her moving on from relationships, but there's sass in there as well. She also talks about suicidal ideation, uh, alcoholism, so she touches on a huge range. I mean, well. 31 tracks. Is, is it fair to say that. she is the biggest pop star in the world Easily, at the yeah. moment? Yeah. Yeah. Easily, yeah. right yeah. now. I mean, I heard her world tour is generating for her, personally, after all expenses is said and done, billions. Absolute billions. And the good thing about Taylor Swift is wherever she goes, wherever she performs, she donates to local food banks and charities yeah. as well. So she always leaves a positive impact, which she doesn't have to do. Mm. She doesn't have to do it all. Very good. So I think it's really nice that she does that. She tries to leave that along the and way. Can we talk about Harry Styles, who should be breathing a sigh of relief? Now, this story is quite dark, actually. Yes. So this isn't the first time that Harry Styles has had a stalker. So a couple mm. of years ago, someone else was done for stalking him. Uh, this was on Tuesday. A woman, a Brazilian woman called Myra Carvalho, mm. she has been given a 14-week jail sentence and she's also been given a 
a restraining order from Harry Styles because in the space of one month, she sent him 8,000 cards. Come on. She moved to London from Brazil, lived in a hostel so that she could be near to him, sent him these cards. Um, just, got... just to be closer to Harry? She yeah. Moved from Brazil to London. Yeah. yeah. Her family didn't know. Her family wow. didn't know. She said that, you know, she had all these thoughts of him. She's got a partner back in Brazil. Um, her doctor in Brazil actually said that he thought she was having a manic episode. Yeah. Um, but obviously the courts have ruled that actually, no, this is not OK. And it's good because it's a good message to send out. And it's, it's so scary for him as well because he had this woman a couple of years ago break into his home, different woman. Mm. Um, she broke into his home and after and he had good security, he's had to up it. So now he has um a night guard and his door has alarms mm. on it, like his bedroom door has alarms on mm. it. And I just can't imagine having to live with that level of fear. It's constantly. the price of fame. Yeah. It is the price, the of, price fame. of fame. Ellie, do you think that is the right sentence? Because clearly she no. needs help I mentally think, yeah and I think you know just putting her in a jail for 14 weeks she'll be back out again but you're not actually dealing with the obsession with Harry absolutely here. I think with with when it comes to these uh, stalkers like this especially famous people mm. um, a lot of the times they believe they're in relationships with them they have genuinely think that there is something going on there mm. they need real help and I think the 14 week jail sentence is good because obviously um, it perturbs people from going there but I think the important thing is the the aftercare for it because they, they need help mm. that she needs to be rehabilitated to understand why you can't behave in this way, why mm -hmm. it's not okay, and to kind of get to the root of those mental health problems. Mm. Because I, for me, you can't send 8,000 cards in one week. Just when you yeah. don't, it, must in a month. it must be terrifying for Harry. Yeah. You know, Absolutely terrifying. I mean, they, they deal with a, a, a lot of restrictions anyway, being famous. You can't just go to the shops and so on, but let alone with that kind of thing mm. happening. I mean, yeah. I, to be honest, would you trade... Would you trade fame for no. that? Is it a price worth paying? No, definitely not. No, no not at all. And I'm, I, I, it's, it's odd as well because we talk about Harry Styles, but actually there's quite a lot of celebrities of all different ranges, yeah. A-list to Z-list, mm. that have ha experienced this. Um, it's not necessarily just the mega famous. It can be someone who's just, you know... Also, it happens in real life as well. It does. You know, this plays out and we hear about this because He's of Harry star. Styles. Yeah. He's a star. Mm. But everyday people get stalked and it's... Terrifying, yeah. Yeah. absolutely terrifying. Well, let's move on to World Record Day today. One of my faves. I can't remember the last time I went into a shop and bought no. a record, which is a shame yeah. because everything's just easily available on the phone. So I love that there's a yeah. day like this. Definitely. So you, uh, so it's the UK World uh, UK Record Store today, uh, and. If you want to find out where, wherever you're living, you want to find out where to go, go to recordstoreday.co.uk because essentially what happens is all the independent record stores across the country open their doors, they put on performances from DJs and you can get exclusive vinyl tracks. I this year, Kate that. Bush is the ambassador. Oh. Um, yeah, so she's got a special vinyl out and you can only get it in the shops. Mm -hmm. So all of these exclusives, you can find out what they are online, but to get your hands on them, you have to physically go in store. And it's really great because then you get the experience of it. A lot of the stores now have little coffee shops in them. Um, you you, know, you can sit down, you can chat to people, you can pick through the music um, and see DJs playing vinyl old school and just loving it. It's, it's so great. Yeah, I, I had a brief interaction with vinyl when I started DJing many years ago. It was just when we were going from vinyl to CDs, the Pioneer CDJs. Yeah. So, I mean, they're so it's just so nostalgic. It's something yeah. to touch. You put the needle down, mm -hmm. you can hear the... I you like know, the crackling noise. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you um, can't fake it with vinyl yeah. either. <laughs> very, very, very quickly, what's your favourite album if you were going to go down to a record Ooh. shop today? Ooh. Oh, God. Taylor Swift? My, no, no, I was going to say, no, no. Abba. Abba all the way. I'm I, such an Abba girl. At the moment, I don't know why in my head, but I've got Shania Twain. Ooh. Some of her early ones, but I think it's probably because the Glasto thing's coming up, and I'm <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, I've been listening to it quite a lot. So, yeah, I think Shania Twain for me. All How right. about you? Thank you, Ellie. Thanks, uh, Ellie. Fantastic, as always. <laughs> You're a right expert, eh? Especially in Taylor Swift, oh, aren't you? Of course. Are you Swifty yet? <laughs> no, absolutely oh, not. I've no, still you've got, got, you got 15, 15 minutes, minutes to convert me. <laughs> it's going to happen, everyone. It's not happening. <laughs> but still to come, we're going to be joined by our amazing Greatest Britain, who's raising awareness of breast cancer in men. I'm really looking forward to this. It's very insightful, and he's uh, doing a really great uh, catwalk for charity as well. So we're going to get stuck into that in just a minute. This is Saturday Morning Live from GB News, Britain's News Channel. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from GB News from the Met Office. So high pressure does continue to dominate our weather, bringing some warm sunshine for some of us. However, there was to be some patchy cloud. Low pressure remains never too far away out towards the north of the UK, but this large area of high pressure dominates our weather through the rest of the weekend. This will bring some warm sunshine, particularly for Wales, southwestern parts of England and Northern Ireland as well. However, there will be some thicker cloud across parts of Scotland that slowly spills its way southwards as we go through Saturday afternoon. 
afternoon. Perhaps a few more breaks in the graphics are showing, so there could be some brighter spells in places. And it will be feeling warm in that sunshine too. Highs in the south of 14, 15, maybe 16 degrees, but definitely feeling a little chillier under that cloud across parts of Scotland. Into Saturday evening, there will still be those clear spells around, but some patchy rain does arrive across northern parts of Scotland and slowly sinks its way southwards as we go into the early hours of Sunday morning. Some clear spells across eastern parts of England and Northern Ireland and Western Scotland as well, and turning chilly under those clear skies, although temperatures holding up well above zero under all that cloud. Into the start of Sunday, after a chilly start under those clear skies, it will be quite a bright start, particularly for southern and eastern parts of England and Northern Ireland, western parts of Scotland, seeing some sunshine through the morning. However, that patchy rain across Scotland slowly sinks its way southwards into northern parts of England, so bringing quite a grey day here. In the sunshine, though, still feeling warm again, highs of 14 or 15 degrees in the south and around 9 or 10 degrees under that cloud. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking, this is a nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Hello, welcome back. It's 11.47. You're with Ben and Steph on Saturday Morning Live, only on GB News. Now, we love to give a spotlight to people who do amazing things on this show. And this week, we're joined by a really fantastic fundraiser for charity Breast Cancer Now, Mark Winter. Mark was sadly diagnosed with breast cancer during lockdown after he encouraged a female friend to get herself checked for the disease. And now on the road to an amazing recovery, Mark is on a mission to raise awareness of the fact that men, as well as women, can get breast cancer too. Next week, we'll see Mark take part in Breast Cancer Now's fashion show where he'll be strutting his stuff <laughs> on the catwalk to raise funds for charity. And we're delighted to say that Mark joins us now. Mark, good morning to you and good congratulations good to our Greatest Britain this Thank week. Thank you very much for having me. Very well deserved. So let's first of all talk about the breast cancer because when we speak about breast cancer, we just instantly assume it's a female problem, don't we? Absolutely. And mm. that's exactly what I did as well. I had absolutely no idea that a guy could get it. Mm -hmm. It was as simple as that. You just assume it's women. Totally. So how, how common is it in men compared um, to, say, women? Per year, per year I think about uh, 25,000 or so women get diagnosed every year and it's mm -hmm. about 350 to 400 men only. Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit about your, the moment you found out you were diagnosed. Did you have mm -hmm. symptoms? How did it all come around? What I, the... I found a lump uh, just here and it had been bugging me because I took a friend to mm -hmm. get her, her breast checked and she was absolutely fine. Um, but it, I think it got into my head then something wasn't quite right. It, you know, I was in that sort of zone. Um, so I rang my doctor. It was, I say it's coming into lockdown. And she said, you know, come, come see me in a couple of days. And then she rang back and said, come and see me now. Um, her attitude changed from a very chirpy person mm -hmm. once she'd examined me to a very something's wrong here person. Did you have a lump? Yeah, I had a lump right under the nipple. It was about... Yeah, two and a half centimetres. And how long had it been there for? I think it had been there for a couple of months. When I think back, I thought it hadn't been there long. Then I think yeah. it was probably a couple of months, realistically, I think. Mm. But it was just hard. It didn't change. It didn't move. I thought, oh, it'll go away. Yeah. 
as blokes do. They just yeah. ignore stuff, don't they, at the end of the day. So that's how, that's when I was diagnosed. And um, so women, they, they tend to... Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to sh mm. show my ignorance here. They tend to have <laughs> um, their, their breasts removed, of course. Yeah. What, what, are men treated in the same way? Yes, I had exactly the same. I was uh, uh, grade three... Um, there. So I've had a complete mastectomy here, big cut under here, yeah. lymph nodes removed from here, so I've got no real feeling oh, in here because there's well. cancer in there. Mm -hmm. So I've been through exactly the same process, chemotherapy, eight sessions, then radiotherapy, and I have to go for a mammogram, which is quite weird because everyone looks at you and thinks, what are you doing here? Um, every, every year, so I've got two more mammograms to go, and then technically I'm clear. Well, I hope it will be clear for I you. I hope so too, yeah. Mark, how has this journey to recovery been for you, like, mentally? Um, it was it was tough. Initially, because it was during COVID, it was tough, because I was on my own quite a lot. You mm. have to go to appointments on your own. You know, people could drop you off at the, the entrance to, you know, normally going for chemo or operations, people can come in with you. Uh, but um, mm. you were just not dumped to the door, that yeah. sounds terrible. <laughs> but you were dumped to the door, you had to wander in on yourself, so you're sitting there on your own, Billy No Mate sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and that, that was quite tough. But, you know, I've got some great, great friends. You know, you don't, I've not got many friends, but the ones I've got are amazing. Mm. And, and that's and, what you need. And look, you've not adopted uh, a sense of victimhood about this, mm. have you? Because you're doing some amazing work now with Breast Cancer Now, the charity. Yes. And you are, as Steph said in the intro, you're going to be strutting your stuff yeah. down the catwalk. What's oh, yes. going on? <laughs> Who's it in aid of? What's, uh, what are you going to be wearing as well? Now, what I'm going to be wearing, Ooh, I have no... That is an important I, question. <laughs> I have no idea at the moment, because I'm meant to be doing a fitting as we speak. OK. So I haven't done that yet. I'm going this afternoon. So I don't know what I'm going to be wearing. Oh. But it should be quite interesting. <laughs> I've, uh, they asked me for do's and don'ts. So I've given the do's and don'ts. So What's I won't your know don'ts? <laughs> <laughs> Very bright pink. <laughs> <laughs> That's my date. So but, when's the show? So the show is on Thursday this week, on the 25th. Um, so we do, a, we do a morning show for friends. Friends and family can come. We get eight guests coming along. And then in the evening is the most important one. It's, yeah. it's sort of the money-raising thing, so special guests come along. And will will the models all be, um, I was going to say victims of breast cancer, but I don't like yes, to use that all, Yes, no, all of, the, all of the people have, yeah, have had breast cancer. Mm, yeah. So there's two guys and mm -hmm. 24 ladies. Mm -hmm. And we all go, we've got, all got three outfits, we strut our stuff up and we strut our stuff back. And Mark, if there is a man watching the show tonight, which there's loads, I mean, today, there's loads of men watching yeah. tonight, today, um, what would be your advice for them? Say if, like, he's watching and he's like, I've had this annoying niggling lump yeah. for a while, but, you know, men, they like to sweep things underneath the carpet, they want to put on this um, image of being strong, what would be your advice to them? I'm, I'm exactly the same as you've described, yeah. And, and now my advice to them, because obviously us guys are told to check down below, but not above. So now it's a sort of a TLC thing. Touch, check and get it, get it looked at. Mm. And Breast Cancer Now, just tell us about the kind of work they do. What kind of charity are they? They, uh, general charity, they raise money in all sorts of ways and then they, they send it off to other smaller research establishments. And that sort and of what, thing. And why did you choose them to raise money for? Were, were they there for you at the start of your diagnosis? Uh, no, not to start with, no. I'm, I'm in a men's uh, ca sort of cancer awareness group called the Men's VMU. Mm. Um, and they approached me because one of the gent gents there that started that has done this show about seven years ago. And he said that these guys were looking for at least a couple of men to come and do the show to emphasise the men's part of the breast cancer thing. And are you now using your experience uh, as having gone through breast cancer and your recovery, are you in touch with other men who have just been diagnosed? Yes. Are you there to support yeah. them? Yes, I'm there for that. I say we have this men's VMU. It's, it's a virtual meetup. So every, once a month we meet up online. We talk about how we're getting on ourselves and people are invited to join. We've now got a website and the Breast Cancer Now website links to our website as well. So we all get together and we try because there's very little support. You know, yeah. when you go to the hospitals, I was given pink this, pink that, pink the other and nothing to do with men's breast cancer. You know, I was the only one in the Hastings Congress Hospital that year, bloke, that had been in. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you end up wearing at so the fashion show. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Absolute pleasure. And please, yeah, send in your pictures, by the way, for... Uh, we'll maybe try and show them on the show next week. Well, we, you could, it can be watched online, breastcancernow.org, and then the show London, so you can... So there'll be a live stream, will there? Yes, there'll be a... Strutting, strutting down the catwalk. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there will be, yeah. So anyone can tune in if they wish, so get on the website okay. and have a look. Mark Thank Winter, you. you are greatest Britain. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us. And, Thank uh, you very much. Congratulations. It's been a pleasure. That's it from us for, for today. Me and Steph, have you enjoyed yourself? I've had an amazing time because you are now a Swifty, Ben. Oh, I don't think I am.
You, we'll, 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 see, we'll have a nice little karaoke. See session, what happens after there? this. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Dawn Neeson is next. See you at the same time next week. Thanks for joining us and have a Thanks. cracking weekend as well. <laughs>